Welcome to Mother Miriam Live on the Station of the Cross Catholic Radio Network with live video streaming brought to you by LifeSite News and the Station of the Cross. Call Mother with your questions at 1-877-511-5483 or email her at mother at thestationofthecross.com. You can view the live stream on Facebook at Mother Miriam Live. Now, here's Mother Miriam. beloved family. Good morning to you. It is wonderful to be with you. And actually, I'm not with you. I'm on a plane today, and I will take your emails and texts that you've sent in, but you won't be able to call in today. I'm so sorry when that happens, but it's a fresh program, and it is for you, and I will be back with you on Monday. Um, But I'm out of town today, so... But we're together. Isn't technology wonderful that we could pre-record a program when we know we're going to be out of town and um, we can still connect and still answer emails and still stay on subject. So stay on subject. So I'm very happy about that. And you know what today is. Today is All Saints Day. All Saints Day. The commemoration of all those who have gone before us and are before the throne of God and especially have been declared saints and canonized by the church. We know that they're in heaven, but all saints covers everybody uh, before the cross and after the cross because Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and David and Moses, all of that, were they perfect? Absolutely not. Were they sinless? Absolutely not. Were they saints? They are if they have turned to God and repented. And as you may know, the Eastern churches uh, celebrate the Old Testament saints, St. Abraham, St. David, and so forth. I don't know why we don't do that in the West, but I love it. I love it. So I have an article here. I always have articles Um, because they sum up things very well and succinctly. And um, it's titled Halloween, a Catholic feast becomes grotesque. And of course, that was last night. And Halloween is a Catholic feast, beloved. We don't think of, we think it's demonic. It's Catholic. Um, It is a contraction of all hallows Eve. We pray the Our Father, Our Father uh, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, holy be thy name, set apart be thy name. That's what this is, all hallows Eve, Holy Eve, the Eve of the celebration of all the holy ones, the saints who went before us, who lived this life, who ran the race, who are with God, uh, whether they died a martyr or not, they lived a heroic, saintly life, and they're with God, and we pray for them, and we thank God for them, for their example, for their sacrifice, for the seed of the martyrs, which is the blood of the church, all of that. And so this article says... Halloween is, quote, unquote, from somebody, uh, from actually the International Association of Exorcists at their Vatican meeting, meeting, quote, Halloween is really evil. Many say Halloween is a simple carnival, but in fact, there is nothing innocent or fun about it. It is the antechamber, A-N-T-E, meaning the, the chamber that leads into something much more dangerous, end quote. Well, That's what it's become, but that's not what it was, beloved. Here, then, are the origins of Halloween in the same article. Halloween's, that is, All Hallows' Eve. So today is All Saints' Day. And last night, October 31st, was Halloween, Hallowed Eve, All Hallows' Eve. That's how it came to be called contractionally, Halloween. All Hallows' Eve is a saintly night, and you know... From that the Jewish calendar, the day is sunset to sunset. So it begins sunset the day before. So today is All Saints Day. It began, the vigil of All Saints began last evening at sundown. So it was the vigil of All Saints, All Hallows Eve. Halloween's innocent origins can be found in a more Catholic age when in preparation for the great feast of All Saints Day, children would go door to door receiving sweets or gifts in return 
for promising to pray for the dead of the family. Listen to the origins of Halloween. Children would go door to door receiving sweets or gifts in return for promising to pray for the dead of the family. Now, that's a good thing, but I don't even like that. We should be giving, not receiving. Quote, a holy and wholesome thought it is to pray for the dead for their guilt's undoing. That's straight from Second Maccabees. Families or parishioners, Second Maccabees, um, chapter 12, verse 46. Read that whole passage and you'll get the church's uh, doctrine on purgatory and praying for the dead. If they're in heaven, we don't need to pray for them. But if they're in purgatory on their way to heaven, they need our prayers. They're still saints because they are holy ones. They are set apart on their way to heaven, whether or not they've been canonized. Um, Families or parishes would organize parties with children dressing as their patron saint and special prayers and masses held to honor the saints. That's it. What patron saint would you like to be? Who would you like to represent? Could be the saint of your uh, confirmation, your uh, what are you, the name taken at baptism, whatever it is. It could, your saint. This tradition, much like the Easter Vigil or Midnight Mass on Christmas Eve, exists because of the church's custom to begin the feast at sunset the previous day. It seems that we inherited this tradition, and we did, from the Jews who count the day from sunset to sunset, not midnight to midnight. Some say that the church inherited this feast from the pagans. However, research indicates that although there was a minor festival in Celtic countries, the pagans celebrated every passing to a new month, not only from October to November. So they would celebrate every uh, eve of the new month. The first attack on Halloween or All Hallows' Eve, as it was called, um, was in 1647 in Protestant Britain when not only the celebrations of Halloween and All Saints' Day were outlawed, but even Christmas was forbidden. In Catholic countries and in New World, the New World, the tradition continued unabated, although slandered by the Puritans, the Puritans in particular, who called it the Devil's Feast. Today, Halloween owes its transformation to the United States, where the horror film boom, the horror film boom in the 1970s, it began to take on a more sinister and even openly demonic form. Everyone has seen for themselves the witches and ghouls, little children vested with devil's horns and youths sporting masks with monstrous features. Many shops people frequent um, now promote ugly and satanic costumes for children and adults. No wonder that the International Association of Exorcists report that the spike in demonic possessions in October is down to the phenomenon of Halloween. The devil's going to take any door we give him, beloved. Father Aldo Buenayuto, (laughs) who leads the association, also warned that for the sects, S-E-C-T-S, it is the best time of year to recruit New members. You see, Satan loves it when we give him a holiday. From here, the door to the devil can be opened. For this reason, it is necessary for us to speak out and not play down the danger. This is not the first time that the church has spoken out against the dangers of today's decadent Halloween. The Polish Archbishop of Lodz, L-O-D-Z, um, stated in his 2013 letter to the faithful that, quote, acquainting children and young people and even adults with the practice of Halloween is incompatible with the teachings of the church. A critical approach to Halloween is all the more necessary as for some it is connected with the worship 
of Satan, the father of all evil, sin, and death, end quote. In 2007, the Archdiocese of Mexico published on its website not only a condemnation of the secular celebration, but also an alternative. Quote, the worst thing is that this celebration has been identified with the neo-pagans, Satanism, and occult worship. Do not let your children wear Halloween costumes or go trick-or-treating. Beloved, I second this a thousand-fold. Do not let your children wear Halloween costumes or go trick-or-treating. Instead, send them to Sunday school or costume parties where they can dress up as biblical characters, as saints, or, or uh, give them candy bags with instructions to give friends a piece, not to take uh, from others, but to give others. That's what saints did. They gave their lives away. So give your children bags of candy. They can eat from it, but they also need to give it to others and dress up as saints. That's what All Hallows' Eve is. As Catholics, the article says, we are called to live in society and make it more Catholic. This is the Christian civilization we strive for. We cannot join in a pagan festival, however, nor can we simply retreat and stay silent. No, we must provide a Catholic alternative full of beauty and innocence to inspire our families and society to truly prepare for the great feast of All Saints Day. You know, I'm reading this to you on All Saints Day. I really, we really should have had this in yesterday's program. Um, because today is All Saints Day, but last night was All Hallows' Eve, and many of your children may have gone door to door, and some parents say, but shouldn't we dress our children up as little saints and uh, still go door to door and be a witness in the world? I say no. The world has grown so incredibly evil that you might be a witness to some, but you don't want to raise your children that way. You want to raise them as Catholics. You want to raise them understanding what these feasts are. They're not feasts of the devil. They're feasts of the saints. Um, today, all the saints in heaven. Tomorrow, all the saints, all souls day. Uh, and the whole month of November, those saints in purgatory. And the only people that go to purgatory are saints. That's it. There's two people in the world, I've said before, my Protestant pastor used to say, the saints and the ain'ts, and he's absolutely right. Those who are going to God in heaven and those through their own uh, will have refused him. And very few, few people go to heaven without passing through purgatory. Very, very, very few. Um, and so they're still saints. Saints are not perfect people. They are set apart from God to the world. And there's nobody in purgatory that was not set apart um, from the world to God. If they didn't live it out perfectly, that's why they're in purgatory getting cleaned up and they need our prayers, but they are forgiven. Nobody is in purgatory who is not forgiven of their sins, but they need to pay the price of the temporal effects, not the eternal effects of separation from God, but the temporal effects of their sins. And as you know, in purgatory, they cannot do that. And so we can pray for them, and we must, so that they could um, be freed to go into heaven. And as St. Catherine of Genoa said, there is not a soul in purgatory that, if given the chance, would opt to go to heaven if they have one stain of sin on them. When they're on earth, they would like to go to heaven without going through purgatory because they, don't, they fear the fires and the flames and the suffering and the purification. However... Once they're in purgatory, they're done with the things of the earth. Where They're done with sin, with its presence, with its power, uh, all of that. And they're in uh, purgatory where there is no sin except the sin they bring with them that has been forgiven. And they've never been so done with the things of the world, says St. Catherine of Genoa, um, in a little book called The Fire of God's Love. They've never been... Uh, 
so close to God. They've never loved God as they will love him in purgatory. And the thing that is the deepest pain, St. Catherine of Genoa says, the deepest pain in purgatory is not the flames of fire that do pur- uh, uh, purge them from their sin. It's definitely, su- it's unquestionable suffering. And yet not one of those souls in purgatory who now is closer to God than they've ever been and who now sees their sin the way they've never seen it before, they would not dare of their own volition to be in the presence of God. They would not want to escape that suffering if it meant that they stood before God with one blemish before a holy God. They wouldn't do it. So they are grateful for the pains and the suffering of purgatory, but they need our prayers because purgatory is a passive state. They can no longer make sacrifices uh, for the, um, the fruits of their temporal sin the temporary sins. They can no longer make reparation for them. That's why we need to make reparation here on earth. That's why we need to do penance. That's why we need to go to confession on a regular basis. That's why we need to take every opportunity to sacrifice in reparation for our sin, no matter what it is. Could have been sin from 20 years ago. We never even knew we committed, yet we did. And are we forgiven? Yes, when we confess our sins, we are forgiven. God is faithful and righteous to cleanse us from our sin. Yes, but the temporal effects of our sin is what we need to pay for. And since um, tonight is the eve of All Souls Day and the whole month of November, and tomorrow is All Souls Day, and the whole month of November we pray for the the, the souls in purgatory, I'm going to mention to some to whom that's confusing and, and does not understand the gift of purgatory. Apostle Paul says the, to the Philippians, um, I am convinced that he who began, Philippians 1, 6, that he who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Christ. And he will, beloved, he will perfect it. How does he perfect it? What happens if we die? The Apostle Paul speaks of those, he writes to the Corinthians uh, chapter three, um, verses 10 and following, I believe he writes to those of the Bema seat. That is the reward for Christians. He's writing to the first church that he ever formed to the first Christians. And he's writing to them and he's talking about what happens to a Christian after death. And he says, there's only one foundation that could be laid. That is that foundation laid by Christ but it's built on by the apostles and prophets and all of that. So if we are forgiven, if we are saved, if we are truly Christians, what happens when we, a saved, forgiven Christian dies? Paul says we go through the judgment of Christ, the particular, what the Catholic Church calls the particular as opposed to the general judgment. Immediately we stand before God and whatever we have done in our life that was not for eternity, that did not honor God, that was not for his glory, will be burned up. And whatever is found to be wood, stay in ho- and wood hay and stubble will burn and be consumed by the fire. And whatever was for eternal glory of God had everlasting value will will go through the fire like precious stone and gold, which you cannot destroy by fire. But what is wood, hay, and stubble will, fi- will be destroyed by fire. And so there will be suffering and tears uh, as we go through that fire. And yet we will be saved, the Apostle Paul says, yet through fire. Well, let me ask you, this is for a saved, forgiven Christian. Uh, someone who believes once saved, always saved, which the Catholic Church believes once saved, always saved. But salvation is a process. And once saved, you're always saved. You can't lose it. But you can't lose what you don't have. And salvation is a process until we are glorified. So um, uh, when a saved, forgiven Christian dies and their whole life is put through the fire and what is wood, hay, and stubble is going to be burned up, that's not a picture of the Christian in heaven. 
And he's no longer on earth, that's for sure. He's died. And he's not in heaven because there's no fire in heaven. There's no judgment in heaven. There's no tears in heaven. There's no suffering in heaven. There's no judgment in heaven. There's none of that in heaven. And so I ask my Protestant friends, so where is it? And they say, I don't know. Uh, I don't know. And I said, well, how do you get perfectly purified? You're saved, but how do you get purified of all that? You go into heaven, you die yet with some sin on you, even though you're forgiven. And my Protestant friend said, well, I don't know. And I say, we don't know. It begins with a P. It's purgatory. It's a place between earth and heaven or a state, whatever God has established, where we're no longer in our human bodies. We're on. It's not a second chance. It's we're on our way to heaven, but we need uh, further reparation for our sins so that when it's it's the burning up of what is basically wood, hay, and stubble. That's what purgatory is. So we are pure gold when we go into heaven and we could stand before a God who is without sin. That's the story. It's what the Jews have always believed. It is what Catholics believe because there is nothing that Catholics believe that has not come from our Jewish roots. Absolutely nothing. And if you don't believe that Maccabees, which talks about purgatory, is a a canonical book of scripture, which of course it is, but Martin Luther took that out um, in the 16th century. But if you don't believe it, read 1 Corinthians, read the whole of chapter 3, and and you will see that. Okay. Um, And so, and the church again is is the church militant on earth, the church suffering in purgatory, the church triumphant in heaven, but it is the church. Not people who merely have the name Catholic or Christian, but truly who are Catholic and Christian, beloved. And so what do I suggest? It's a little late for Halloween if you've already taken your children uh, trick-or-treating. What many I know Catholic homeschooling families do is they go to the church and there's an evening mass for All Hallows Eve, the Eve of All Saints Day. And they form their cars in the parking lot in a big circle. They back in. So the cars are in a big circle all backed in. And their trunks are full of candy. And all the children have, have dressed up as little saints. And they need to tell you who they are, and a story of who they are. I'm St. Catherine of Siena, and they need to give you a two, three-minute talk on Catherine of Siena. They need to know their faith. They need to tell you why. Who is Catherine of Siena? Why they chose her. And it's wonderful. And then they go around from car to car, and the parents or the families, they have shopping bags or whatever they have that they've made, and they collect a whole bunch of candy. But they don't have to be afraid of poison. They don't have to be afraid of razor blades in the candy. It's wholesome. It's beautiful. And they can go to each car, and the the parents or the children of that car will give them candy, and they will also give some back for other children. It's a beautiful, beautiful thing. I beg you, beloved, keep your children. Let them be in the world and not of it. If they're in the world again, and you don't go any place on Sunday that requires somebody to be working, to admit you to a park, no. If you have to pay to get into a park, you don't go to that park on Sunday. You go on Saturday. Uh, The merry-go-round, the amusements, the store, shoppings, restaurant, going out as a family on Sunday, it's a very selfish thing to do. You're doing it as a family, but what you're saying is, you know, we're we're living as queens on the earth. We could care less that you work on Sunday. You see, that's terrible. We need to withdraw from the world completely on Sunday. Let the stores close down, and they will be open to not lose a day's pay, a day's purchases. They will be open full-time, six days a week, and you'll be able to work six days a week. But let them close on Sunday. And if they don't, beloved, it's our fault. It's our fault. And what's your problem, Mother Miriam? You think everything is our fault? I do. Because there's enough of us to change the world if we lived our faith. I do. I do. 
if we walk through the world modestly and Catholic girls and their mothers did not walk through the world in, in tights or leggings as if they were in their underwear. I told you before that would be underwear for me when I was a girl. It's, it's a horrible that they display their bodies like that. It's absolutely immoral, immodest, and horrible. Why would you even tell anyone you're Catholic? You should keep it a secret until you could represent a Catholic, until you could represent the Blessed Virgin, until you could be a witness in the world. So am I being hard? I'm not. I'm being Catholic, beloved. I'm not a fanatic. I'm a simple Catholic. We should all be simple Catholics. God bless you, beloved. There's the music for our break. And you won't be able to call in today because I pre-recorded this fresh new program for you, but I will take the emails that we have received as soon as we're back from the break. So you can continue to email at mother at the station of the cross.com. God bless you and we'll be right back. This Divine Mercy Reflection is from the Diary of St. Maria Faustina. In paragraph 1293, St. Faustina falls into a minor error she had resolved not to. She writes, I fell again into a certain error, and at this I felt such acute pain in my soul that I interrupted my work and went to the chapel for a while. I apologized to the Lord, all the more ashamed because of the fact that in my conversation with him after Holy Communion this very morning, I had promised to be faithful to him. Then I heard these words, If it hadn't been for this small imperfection, you wouldn't have come to me, humbling yourself and asking my forgiveness. I poured out a superabundance of graces on your soul, and your imperfection vanishes before my eyes, and I see only your love and your humility. You lose nothing but gain much. God's love looks beyond our weakness and sinfulness. In the humble soul, he sees only love and humility and pours out his graces. This Divine Mercy Reflection is brought to you by the Station of the Cross. Confusion on matters of faith and morals is widespread, even within the church. It can be disheartening, with clergy celebrating gay pride masses, the Pope considering allowing women to become priestesses. It is easy to lose sight of the true teachings of the church. LifeSite News Catholic can help. We are a clear, trustworthy news source that is dedicated to the teachings of the church. We, as the laity, have a duty to know and defend our faith and tradition. In order to do so, we must be educated on the teachings of the church and on the truth about current events and developments within the church. Follow LifeSite News Catholic on Facebook and Twitter, or sign up to receive our emails by going to LifeSiteNews.com in order to maintain your clarity and peace in the midst of chaos. Welcome back to Mother Miriam Live, beloved. We have this half hour to ourselves, only you know that we're not live today. I've pre-recorded this program to you because I'm out of town, and I'll be back on Monday. Um, but I'm going to take your text. You just won't be able to call in today. I'm going to take your emails. We have a text from Mark, and he says, Hi, Mother. Could you give me some insight <clears throat> as to why some traditional Catholics accuse Pope St. John Paul II of knowing of and covering up the sexual abuse scandal? They also claim that many of his teachings are problematic. Could you talk a bit about him for a little? What do you think he is? To many, he is a modern hero and a great saint. To some, he is part of the problem. My dear Mark, um, I absolutely respect your question and tell you that it is a bit confusing. I do believe he's a modern, modern hero and great saint and perhaps a little part of the problem as well. Let me tell you why I say that. Um, I personally love John Paul II. I've met him in person, um, and he's meant a great deal to me. Um, It was said of him during his pontificate that there's so much wrong going on in the church. And again, he confirmed female altar servers, and I was was really um, 
very much against that. It, it disheartened me tremendously that he would do that. Um, and other things, uh, communion in the hand, and um, there were some huge masses where the Eucharist was treated in such an awful, awful way that when the thousands left the next day, there were fragments all over the ground and the dirt, and the, it, it just breaks your heart. What I noticed is that, um, well, I'll tell you, I, I came across a Catholic man. He's had 12 children. It was at a conference. His children are all grown and married, and now he has umpteen grandchildren. I said, how many of your children are still Catholic? He said, all 12. I said, no, my goodness, how on earth did that happen? He said, you know, um, we focused on what was, and him, uh, he had, no, I think he didn't have 12 children. His mother had 12 children. I'm sorry about that. He does have children, and all of them are Catholic, and they're raising Catholic grandchildren. But he was one of 12 siblings. And his mother, I said, what did you do in the home? I wish I had a video to go to see how your mother raised 12 of you, 12 of you all Catholic, not in name, but truly, and married and have Catholic children. It's astounding in today's world. He said, yes. You know, he said, my parents never really disciplined us much. They only taught us truth. They didn't tell us what was going on that was wrong in the church or the world. And when we did things... They simply told us the truth of the matter. Um, that's all we kept hearing. That's all we kept learning. And when I spoke to him somehow, this was some years ago, but I thought of John Paul II, who was Pope at the time. And I said, you know, I think that's his mode of operation. John Paul, there's so much wrong in the church, the sex scandal, which he knew. Uh, I don't know what he knew and what didn't. I didn't always agree and approve of, as if I need to approve, of what the way he did things and all of that. But he taught more, they're considering now making him a doctor of the church, um, he taught more than I think all the previous popes put together. All he wanted to do was get the truth out. And I think that's the issue with John Paul. He want, I feel that way, dear Mark. I'm not getting younger. I want to put my arms around the whole world, and yet um, I've been kept in Tulsa without, uh, out of obedience, not being able to do anything or take women in and all of that. And so um, what do I do? Um, I could rant on a lot about what's wrong, and I do say what's wrong so that people could identify it, but my, my, and I want to uh, uh, explain the gravity of it, but I want to spend my time helping people how to live in it and through it, knowing the truth, not just saying, don't go trick-or-treating, it's not our holiday, but telling people who they are and urging parents in this particular instance, let's say, to raise their children Catholic so their children are not just kept from the world. Mom, I want to do that. No, the children have an identity. They don't want to do that. Why would they want to do that? Why would they want to go out in the midst of evil? Why would they want to dress like the devil when they know the devil put Jesus on the cross? They don't even want to do that. It's against everything they are, you see? So that's my point, and I think that's what it was with John Paul. Look at his writings they're utterly magnificent, and they're true. And so, and I, I do believe he was very, very close to Our Lady, and I know people who heard him speaking to Our Lady and just so many beautiful, beautiful things. So I do think he's a modern hero and a great saint. And I do think we could say, in some sense, he's part of the problem, um, just in the same way I've been part of the problem. I remember once when I told a couple uh, to go to the service of the husband's parents. His father was a Protestant pastor and conducting a private service. And I said, yes, just to love them and come into their world, go. I was strongly corrected by a priest on air who heard that. And I've been forever grateful to him because we need to bring 
the world to Christ. Uh, and we're so focused with ecumenism and uh, uh, buying into um, I'm okay, you're okay. We are destroying ourselves as Catholics and letting ourselves be destroyed. So uh, it's the best I can do right now, dear Mark. Um, I believe St. John Paul is indeed a saint, a modern hero. I have a great personal love and appreciation for him. Um, was he perfect? No, I don't think so. Um, was Were any popes perfect? I don't know any, uh, even though they're great saints. And so um, uh, I absolutely support him. I have a, a beautiful picture of him in my office um, and uh, that was given to me. And I, I just... Um, I, I truly have great respect for that Pope and consider him a saint, not as a mistake at all. So that those are my thoughts. We have a text from Ephraim, and Ephraim writes, Mother, do you think that the difference between the Latin rite and the Eastern rites regarding the primacy of the Father as opposed to the Son is serious? Uh-oh, I haven't gotten this question before. Um, we will continue this when we come back from the break. Beloved, again, it's, it'll be our final segment today, but because the program is pre-recorded, beloved, you won't be able to call in, but you'll be able yet to send emails at mother at the station of the cross.com. And we'll be right back. We stand at a crossroads in history. We can stand up for life, family, and a Christian culture, or we can stand idly by while the fabric of society becomes fundamentally anti-life, anti-family, and anti-Christian, slowly leading to its own demise. LifeSite News is the leading defender of life, family, and Christian culture. Through our news reporting, we seek to educate readers with information and zeal. They need to fight the most crucial battles of our day, and we need your help to continue that mission. You can support LifeSite News by following our social media pages on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Another way to support LifeSite is to prayerfully consider becoming a Sustain Life monthly donor to help us continue to save lives in the culture. To donate, visit give.lifesitenews.com forward slash sustain life. Our staff of over 40 and millions of future generations Thank you for helping to save the culture. The Liturgy of the Hours is prayed three times a day on the Station of the Cross at 5 a.m., 3 p.m., and 9.30 p.m. Eastern. The Liturgy of the Hours is a meditative and efficacious way to foster habitual prayer. It is the daily prayer of the Church, prayed throughout the world by priests, religious, and laity. For details about each hour and more information about the Liturgy of the Hours, visit thestationofthecross.com. Tune in weekdays from 6 to 7 a.m. Eastern for Sermons for Everyday Living. There's no better way to start your day than with spiritual formation from inspiring priests as they preach the gospel in the midst of your busy life. For details about upcoming episodes and for podcasts of past shows, visit thestationofthecross.com and click on Sermons for Everyday Living under the Programs tab. That's Sermons for Everyday Living, weekdays, 6 to 7 a.m. Eastern, on the Station of the Cross. Welcome back to Mother Miriam Live, beloved, and we have a little over 15 minutes for me to continue answering your texts and emails, and as I've mentioned earlier, this program was pre-recorded, brand new program for you, but I'm out of town today, so we pre-recorded it, and I won't be able to take your calls, but I will continue with your texts. And Ephraim texts in, Mother, do you think that the difference between the Latin rite, R-I-T-E, and the Eastern rites regarding the primacy of the Father as opposed to the Son is serious? 
Do you think there is a right and wrong here? I also wonder if there is a right and a wrong regarding the sacrament of confirmation. Latin rite has it at the teenage years. The Eastern rites have it at infancy. Why is that? Okay. Um, The difference generally between uh, the Latin and the Eastern rites, um, see, it depends, the primacy of the father as opposed to the son. The Eastern rites that are not Catholic, um, the, the issue was political in the 1600s, but the split, but also um, it was the, uh, the doctrine of the procession of the Holy Spirit, what's called the filioque clause, uh, whether or not the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father alone, which those Eastern churches that split off from the Catholic Church believe, or from the Father and the Son. And so those who believed it was from the Father alone um, and uh, broke with the Catholic Church and broke with the, the papacy. Um, they're valid. Their sacraments are valid because they had a true apostolic succession and continue to have that succession, but they do not come under the Pope and, um, and again, uh, believe that the Holy Spirit has proceeded from the Father and not from the Father and the Son. Um, and that may be the, the issue of the primacy of the Father as opposed to the Son. Um, if one doesn't believe that the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son, it is serious. It is serious. Um, I, uh, apart from that, uh, Ephraim, uh, you have a, an Easter name after St. Ephraim, a uh, magnificent saint of the Church uh, in union with the Catholic Church and a saint. Um, uh, apart from that, um, I don't know that the Eastern rites in union with the Catholic Church, there are now, as I understand, 23 rites in the Church, R-I-T-E-S, the Latin being only one of them. I don't know if the Eastern rites, if they still, who believe that the Holy Spirit believe, uh, proceeds from the Father and the Son and say the entire Nicene Creed, um, I don't know if um, they still have a primacy of the Father. Part of the complaint of the Latin Church is that they don't put enough emphasis on the Father. So I, I don't know, uh, you know, where that comes from with the primacy on the Father, um, uh, as opposed to the Son. I'm not sure. It may depend on what right you're in. Um, and Ephraim says, "Do you think there's a right and wrong here?" Well. I do think there's a right and wrong if one is emphasized to the um, to the loss of the other in such a way that they're not seen as equally God, as three equal persons, um, that nobody is superior. They are three beings in the one Godhead, all equally God, all having all the attributes of of God. So he says, I also wonder if there is a right and wrong regarding the sacrament of confirmation. Latin rite has it at the teenage years, and the Eastern rites have it at infancy. Actually, the Latin rite has it, according to canon law, at the age of discretion. And the age of discretion is generally thought to be around seven years old. And um, many, many, most Latin rite churches, in fact, uh, talking about the extraordinary form of the Mass, have confirmation at the age of seven, around that. Uh, it was the Novus Ordo that began to make it later and later until it reached teenage years, somewhere between around 14. Uh, that's really up to the diocese, who thinks that children should be older and have more of a handle on their faith before they are confirmed. Um, uh, the problem is that many teenagers, even at 14, uh, are confirmed because their parents force it, uh, which is a terrible thing, because if you force it, and it's not the desire of the child at any age, you are teaching that child hypocrisy. You're teaching them that religion is an absolute lie and simply a show, and they should reject that. If a child does not understand, does not believe, does not want to be confirmed, which makes him now an adult in the faith, 
to receive the gifts of the Holy Spirit in a greater degree that he did at his baptism and now begin to live the spiritual warfare and be responsible for it. If he doesn't believe that, if he doesn't want it, I beg you not to force him, not for show, not because you're embarrassed, not for any reason. If he says, I want to because I'll be an outcast, I don't want to be the only one in my class not confirmed, say, well, if you're the only one in the class who doesn't believe, you should not be confirmed. Live it with a heart of integrity. Well, other kids are being confirmed. They don't believe it either. And I'd say to your son, this isn't a circus. This is a matter of bowing before a holy God and worshiping him. And if it's not what comes from your heart, you don't do it. Okay. The Eastern rites at infancy, um, I, 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 you know, I've never personally... Uh, weighed the two to see what I personally would prefer. I know people who uh, even go to my extraordinary form Latin church who have had their babies confirmed and had first communion as infants. Baptism, uh, first communion, and confirmation, all in the same, just a week away from their birth. And now they take those tiny little infants who can't even walk yet and every Sunday bring them up to the communion and they receive Holy Communion from the, from the priest at the Latin Rite Church. They receive Holy Communion. Um, it, maybe the priest breaks off a tiny, tiny piece of the host, but those little babies, no matter how old they are, receive our Lord on their tongue because they have received the sacraments fully uh, just after their birth. I personally think it's a magnificent thing because it gives them every manner of grace and strength to be holy and to fight the evil of the world, especially if they're raised in a good and solid Catholic home. I think it's truly wonderful, but I I, uh, am not in a position to really urge it on parents to do that or to be part of the Easter rite for that to happen because I haven't gone into it further. Whatever you do is okay, Latin or Eastern. It's absolutely okay. But I absolutely love it when children can be received, not just their first communion, but can be confirmed at the age of seven. They need, they're old enough to begin to make decisions and grow up to be young adults and be protected from the Uh, sex ed and the evil of the world by first getting confirmed at 12 to 14 when they're already so much shaped and affected by the world. I I would love to see all children raised in Catholic homes and be uh, received again, not just their communion, but their confirmation at seven, only if they can tell the priest what confirmation is and their parent and why they want to be confirmed. We have an email from uh, Italy from uh, Michael, I'm not sure quite, or Michaeli, I'm not sure how to pronounce your name, dear one, um, and who writes, Dear Mother, I'm Michael uh, Durigello, I'm sorry to mispronounce your name, writing from Italy. I'm 37, and I'm on a wheelchair since I was born. Oh, my goodness. I've heard about your will to spread to lay people the Benedictine rule. This is why I ask you if, as a male, I can join you, uh, Mary's Oblates too. Um, I, uh, it's not too simple to live in this world, but I have always had in my heart the rule of St. Benedict as a reference. I'd like to become an Oblate according to the rule, um, but not every priest is a good priest or monk to speak to. My will is not to live the rule as one of the rules, as one of the rules as sometimes happens. My will, with his help, is not to disappoint our Lord. Thanks a lot. Laudate uh, Jesus Christus. Praise be to Jesus Christ. Um, Mikael or Mikaeli, I'm so sorry, I don't know how to pronounce your name. Yes, you can be a man, being a Mary's oblate. Mary has, she is the, is the um, mother of all the priests and all the oblates, absolutely. And we are daughters of Mary. And so we have, Mary's oblates are daughters and sons of Mary. 
um, it, whether you're a woman, a male, a, fa- a whole family, uh, it doesn't matter. Any age does not matter. You could be a teenager. If you want to become Mary, one of Mary's oblates, um, you absolutely can. And um, if you're in Italy, we will mail the materials to you because we have people now writing in, and we've hardly begun it yet. Actually, the first newsletter for Mary's Oblates is going to be an eight-page newsletter, and it will normally be mailed just to the Oblates. But for the first one, it's going to be mailed to our entire mailing list, anybody that's on our mailing list, and uh, who or who wishes to sign up between now and next month when the uh, uh, the email will be mailed. It only goes out about four times a year. And you can go to our website, www.motherofisraelshope.org, click on the newsletter tab, and right there you'll have you'll be able to sign up. Now, most people out of the country sign up email only because they want to save us postage, and we very much appreciate that. Um, you can make donations via uh, the Internet online. You can send us requests. You can do all of those things. However, for this next newsletter, I really, it's going to cost us several thousand dollars, beloved. We don't charge a penny. But we have an extremely special newsletter to send out with a very incredible gift enclosed. And we can't do that. We'll send the newsletter out by email, but those who receive it by email will not receive the inserts um, because they, we can't send that by email. And anyone who receives it by email that hasn't received the things that we're going to enclose can simply write us and say, could you send them to us? And we will. But in this case, if you will include your, your snail mail as well, we, you will get the full package. And um, we, we're going to trust our Lord to help people who are able to be generous uh, to help us cover postage, but we don't charge for anything, including the newsletter, including uh, membership in Mary's Oblates, including postage. We don't charge for anything. We have never charged and uh, for speaking engagements for anything. Whatever people have been able and wish to do, we receive. And I tell you, beloved, we have lacked nothing. God has met our every need, and he always will if it's his will. So we are extremely thank you. So uh, thankful. So dear Mikael, the fact that you've been in a wheelchair from birth is absolutely incredible. And we would love you to be an oblate and to correspond with you. And you've given me the opportunity by your email to be able to tell many people, no matter where you are, uh, you could be uh, one. Of, why is it Mary's oblates? Because we're the daughters of Mary, mother of Israel's hope. So we're oblates of Mary, sons and daughters of Mary. And Mary's oblates is a shorter way to say it. And um, but you can be anywhere in the world. It's at any age, and any vocation. Uh, so um, uh, if you're a religious of a community. You shouldn't apply to be an oblate because you don't want your life to be so divided. If you're an oblate of another Benedictine community, uh, such as Norsha, wonderful, wonderful Benedictine communities, stay with them and don't leave them to come with us. And you don't want to be oblates of more than one community. So um, uh, if you're no longer active in another oblate community and want to terminate with them, Uh, because you would want to do that anyway and become part of us, you need to have a letter from them terminating you. So, And I'm not asking you to leave anything to come to us. I'm asking you to be faithful where you are. Um, But this is a good opportunity for individuals who are alone, families who want a rule of life, who want help living this life in a world that's not only turned from God, but in a church, the church, our Lord established, which is being attacked from every end right now, so that even the elect are being deceived, as Our Lady and the Scripture said it would, um, and is being destroyed not from without, beloved, but from within. We want to be together as a family with firm, solid, faithful Catholics, and we will send this letter, oblate letter, out every single month 
to have some form of very easy formation process that everybody can do based on their own state of life. God bless you, beloved. Have a wonderful weekend, and we'll see you Monday.